guess we get going here. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jan Senzamir. I'm a senior scientist at Yasa and Boku, and I'm the moderator this afternoon for the ninth webinar for the Merlin Project. This is the EU Nature Restoration Law. It's an opportunity for scaling up restoration of freshwater ecosystems. And uh, we're very, very lucky to have two people offering us perspectives, both from, the, from NGOs as well as from the investment bank. We have with us Claire Baffer, Senior Water Policy Advisor at WWF and an EU policy specialist with a strong commitment for nature and environmental protection. And we also have Eva Meyerhofer, Head of the Environmental Policy Unit in the Sustainability and Quality Management Department in the European Investment Bank. She's been leading their efforts to support the European Union and in international biodiversity policies and develop business models and financing instruments. So we have a not a long presentations today that actually we'd like to maximize opportunities for people to ask questions. And that uh, so we'll have Claire will give a 15 minute introduction into the restoration law itself. And then Eva will come in and talk about for five minutes slated the what does the restoration law mean for the uh, European Investment Bank. Following that, there'll be this question and answer uh, session, which I'll moderate to try. So please um, use the uh, raise your hand function. I'll try to be looking at people, in, but you can also submit your questions during the presentations, put it in the chat. I will try to track that and uh, keep that uh, available for the speakers to answer your questions. So um, since the major point here is to get going. I will step out of the way and warmly welcome Claire and Eva. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedules to uh, help us look at these issues. Claire Baffer, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Jan, for this introduction, and thank you for inviting me to, to speak. Welcome, everyone. So I will uh, give you a presentation of um, our NGO perspective on the EU nature restoration law, um, focusing, of course, on the uh, what it means for freshwater ecosystems, and happy to take any questions after, after that. Um, so uh, to give you a little bit of a background, um, the EU Nature Restoration Law is uh, one of the flagship initiatives of the European Green Deal. It was already uh, announced in the EU Biodiversity uh, Strategy for 2030, uh, where we could read that the EU uh, would propose legally binding nature restoration targets. And it was actually um, presented as a proposal by the European Commission uh, on the 22nd of June um, this year. Um, here is a little bit uh, how we could summarize the, uh, the nature restoration uh, law. There is first an overarching uh, objective and, and target. Uh, then you have some restoration targets that are specific to each ecosystems. And then the implementation framework um, is uh, that member states need to submit national restoration plans uh, on which uh, they need to uh, report uh, regularly to the European Commission. Um, here is a bit uh, more detail about the objectives and the targets. So, as I said, there is an overall uh, objective, which is uh, that restoration measures by 2030 should cover 20% of the EU's land and sea. And by land, uh, they also mean actually um, the freshwater ecosystems and the, the rivers. And by 2050, measures should be in place for all ecosystems in need of restoration. So, of course, this uh, objective is a bit broad and, and vague, but the idea is to set um, a long-term ambition as well for, for the EU nature restoration law. Um, and then you have different restoration targets that are more specific to um, each of the different ecosystems. Today, uh, I will focus mostly on the ones that are related to freshwater. So uh, 
the ones for protected habitat types and habitats of protected species that derive uh, directly from the habitats directive. The one on river connectivity, which is uh, actually my main focus. And the ones on agroecosystems, because you have there things about peatlands that are, I think, quite uh, relevant as well. Um, so uh, I, I will give a little bit more uh, details on each of, of those. Um, first, the ones that are based on the existing legislation and uh, especially on the Habitats Directive that you can find in Articles 4.5 of, of the law um, are for uh, so terrestrial and also marine protected habitat types and species. And basically they require that based on the data available from um, the Nature Directive's reporting and, and other uh, sources for marine, uh, member states uh, will be required to put in place uh, restoration measures to improve degraded areas and also to re-establish some uh, of them that were lost. And as well, uh, for species to improve, re-establish and reconnect the habitats for species in addition to the habitats type. Um, so then you have specific targets that are set for 2030, 2040, and 2050. Um, one thing to mention as well is that um, areas that are being restored uh, have to show an improvement in condition. And there is also um, a clause that it's, is saying that the habitats uh, that are uh, restored should not deteriorate. Um, of course, there are some exceptions that are listed, but still there is a general non-deterioration uh, clause that applies inside and outside the Natura 2000 network. Um, so this um, applies not only to freshwater ecosystems, but still um, it applies mainly to uh, the habitats listed in Annex 2 of the Habitats Directive. And you can see the list here. And you see that, of course, it includes river, lakes, alluvial and riparian habitats, um, but also wetlands, uh, both inland and, and coastal. Um, and um, uh, so, you, you, so, I mean, all those are, are freshwater um, ecosystems. And I think you can also find um, some freshwater habitats under heath and, and scrub for more uh, specific types of, of um, of, uh, of freshwater habitats. Then uh, the Commission also proposed a specific target on river connectivity, um, which um, obliges member states to identify and remove the river barriers um, in order to contribute to the targets that I've just mentioned uh, on uh, restoring or uh, recreating habitats um, and ecosystems and also to contribute to the objective that was set in the EU biodiversity strategy to restore at least 25,000 kilometers of free-flowing rivers. Um, it is mentioned that um, when identifying uh, and removing the barriers, member states should primarily address obsolete barriers, um, because this is indeed a quite um, large um, uh, potential to tap in. And uh, it is also um, mentioned that member states should complement the removal of the barriers which, uh, with sorry, measures necessary to improve the natural functions of the related um, floodplains. So it's both uh, removal of barriers that are uh, longitudinal and lateral, so both dams but also uh, dikes along rivers, um, and also uh, improvement of the natural functions of, uh, of floodplains. Um, I've put here the full text of this uh, Commission's proposal on river connectivity of Article um, 7, but mostly um, for, for you to read, I will share my slides afterwards so you can have a read if, if you haven't done so already, but I won't, uh, I won't read it uh, out loud now. And then I also wanted to mention that under Article 9 on agricultural ecosystems, you also have um, a specific clause on restoring peatlands, drained peatlands, 
Um, so member states should uh, restore and partly rewet uh, certain shares of drain peatlands under agricultural use. And here, uh, the law gives more specific targets um, on, on what share should be restored and rewetted by 2030, 2040, um, and 2050. And there are also flexibility clauses that are giving the option uh, for member states to also work on peatlands, uh, on peat extraction sites, and other types of drained um, peatlands, but without uh, specific targets associated to those ones. And then um, the Commission's proposal also detail uh, how national restoration plans should be uh, prepared um, and what they should contain. So for instance, a description of the restoration measures, of the non-deterioration measures, uh, detail on how the measures should be financed, and instructions to conduct a public or stakeholder engagement. Um, what the Commission has proposed is that uh, the national restoration plans should be submitted to the Commission two years after the entry into force of the regulation. Um, and what's important as well is that the, the proposal foresees that the national restoration plans will be assessed by uh, the Commission. Um, but also um, that if uh, the Commission finds out that the plans are not um, good enough to reach the targets set by the law, then uh, the Commission can ask member states to submit a new plan, um, which uh, is a little bit more stringent than uh, in other types of uh, environmental law. Uh, so what uh, do uh, we uh, as NGOs um, uh, think of, of this proposal. Uh, I've put you the link of our um, analysis of the proposal uh, done by WF, but together with other um, NGOs, we've worked on that with EEB, with BirdLife, with Client Earth. Um, overall, we, we very much support the legal proposal. We think it's quite a historical um, opportunity. Uh, because it's the very first time that the European Commission tackles uh, nature restoration. Uh, traditionally, they had focused more on uh, the protection of, of ecosystems and of nature. And now for the first time, they add a component, which is about restoration. So it, it's definitely a huge opportunity uh, to bring nature back and to, to, to put a stop to biodiversity loss, uh, also benefiting climate and people. So uh, overall, we really support um, this proposal. We are also supportive of uh, how it is structured um, globally, so having this overarching objective and, and specific restoration targets for different ecosystems. Um, and we also uh, see with a favorable eye the, this nature, uh, this national, sorry, uh, restoration plans. Uh, then, of course, we see some elements that could be strengthened. Um, first, in terms of overall uh, enforceability, um, it's not at the moment exactly clear how member states' contribution will feed in the overarching objective. Um, then we think that there is room to improving um, the ambition level of the target, because as I've said, there are some targets for 2030, 2040, and 2050. But when you look into the detail, uh, you realize that a lot of the effort is actually delayed to 2040, 2050, while we would like to see most of the effort taking place um, before that in 20, uh, by 2030 to really hold the, um, the, the biodiversity loss. Um, then we also would like to see the targets in free-flowing rivers um, and peatlands reinforced, and I will uh, go into that in a minute. Um, and, and then we think it's a little bit missing as well, um, some elements on finance, and we, we would like to see, for instance, a dedicated funding instrument specifically for nature restoration law um, in the next multi-annual financial framework. Um, and also see uh, more details on how the existing funding, for instance, um, the, the common uh, agricultural policy would be um, used as well. More specifically, um, on uh, the river connectivity provisions, uh, we think that the free-flowing river target needs to be strengthened because 
at the moment it is formulated in a in quite a vague way um, for instance, member states are required to identify and to remove uh, river barriers, but only to contribute to um, the objective of the biodiversity strategy. And this wording contributes to, uh, at the end, leaves a large room for maneuver um, to, to member states. So we would like here to see uh, a much uh, tighter wording. Um, and also, at the end, this uh, objective of uh, restoring 25,000 kilometers of free-flowing rivers, um, well, if you um, compare that to the actual length uh, of EU rivers, you realize it's only 2% 2 per 2 of EU rivers. So is that ambitious um, enough um, to, to curve um, freshwater biodiversity, biodiversity loss? Mm, we're not so, so uh, convinced. So. That's why we advocate for uh, raising this target to 15% of river length um, by 2030. Um, we uh, also think that the, the current text, uh, which encourages to address primarily obsolete barriers, um, is a little bit risky um, because we uh, already see a lot of member states arguing that um, river barriers cannot be said uh, obsolete because you can still, for instance, uh, repower them into hydropower plants. So uh, therefore, we, we also advocate for removing um, the focus on obsolete barriers. And instead, we think that barriers should be prioritized for removal according to uh, the ecological benefit uh, of, of uh, the barrier removal. Um, and, and finally, we also um, don't support references that are made in the article to the Water Framework Directive and the uh, uh, Trans-European Transport Network because um, there are references to the possibility of using exemptions under those two directives, and we think it's really counterproductive. Um, instead, there should be maybe a connection made to the, uh, the objectives, for instance, of the Water Framework uh, Directive, which is to achieve good water stages. Um, so what's the policy timeline um, for the EU nature restoration law? Well, um, it's now in the hands of the European Parliament on the one hand and the Council on the other hand, so member states. Um, the policy process has already started in the two institutions. Uh, in the European Parliament, it's the Environment Committee that is in the lead. Um, the rapporteur is a Spanish MEP socialist called Cesar Luena. Um, he will present his report on the text in January. Um, and then there will be a vote of the NV Committee in May uh, and a plenary vote of the Parliament in, in June. Um, the fisheries and agriculture committees are also involved in some aspects of the text that are related to their um, competences. And in the council uh, side, uh, discussions have already uh, started as well in the working party for environment. It will be um, discussed in the 20th of December. There will be an exchange of views um, under the Czech presidency. And then the position of the council will be finalized um, under the Swedish presidency. So probably at the end of uh, the first semester of next year. Um, so yeah, it, it means basically that by probably June, July 2023, we should have the position both of member states and of the European Commission. And then final trialogues, so final negotiations, um, will happen probably in the autumn of 2023 uh, under the Spanish presidency. And um, normally we could expect uh, the law to be adopted by the end of the year 2023. Um, and as it is a regulation and not a directive, it doesn't have to be transposed in national law. It will, be, um, it will uh, enter into force uh, as soon as it is uh, adopted. So basically, there is one year to make a difference, uh, make sure that the final text um, is not uh, watered down uh, by the different players, um, and, and that, uh, yeah, that there is still a good ambition of the nature um, restoration law. 
I've put at the end of my presentation some useful references, communication materials that uh, we have developed as WWF and also together with other NGOs, so you can have a look. Um, and thank you very much. I can uh, reply to some questions after we hear from um, Eva. Thank you very much, Claire. So uh, then Eva will now speak about what the restoration law may mean for the European Investment Bank. Thank you very much, Jan, and thank you very much, Claire, for, for this very clear presentation. I wish I had it you know, uh, before in terms of understanding uh, the requirements under the nature law, which have been a moving feast in, in, in a way. Um, and difficult to translate for, for financing institution also. But what does it actually mean? I mean, I think there is recognition uh, that scaling up uh, investments in restoration is absolutely critical. Um, and it has been recognized, not uh, least due to the challenges posed by climate change, but more action and funding are urgently needed to scale up restoration. So that, that is absolutely clear. Um, but however, uh, there are a number of factors that are, are, are preventing and are often um, uh, uh, more importantly, many of the pledges that are being made, uh, even the ones that are being uh, included in the, in the restoration law are unfunded and how to finance restoration at scale still remains uh, very much a challenge. And so for a financing institution, um, uh, when we look at it, we see that most of the funding uh, comes from public sources, but it will not be sufficient to meet the amounts required to address the scale uh, of the challenges. And moreover, large financial flows, including subsidies, continue to drive environmental degradation. So we, we do have those tensions between the different uh, policies, even within, uh, within the European Union, uh, to which uh, Claire has uh, alluded to. Uh, and these are at least uh, an order uh, of magnitude greater than those that are uh, beneficial. So importantly for us, what we are trying to do uh, at, at this point is also uh, uh, mapping and monitoring private sector investments in restoration. Um, and what we are seeing is uh, that this is hindered by uh, definitions and data challenges. Still, even though uh, the EU is rich in data, that data nevertheless is inconsistent um, we are finding definitions uh, of, let's say, uh, uh, definitions of restoration and understandings of uh, restoration not being coherent uh, uh, across uh, member states, but also across private sectors and across general policy. Um, and um, however, the funding is clearly low in relation to the public spending uh, and overall need. And we've seen that, uh, for example, in the uh, recovery package, uh, how much uh, funding was awarded uh, to, towards restoration or even to biodiversity in general. Uh, so that is still not a, a priority. And so finance really needs to be mobilized across the full restoration continuum through either greening the finance uh, and ensuring that finance does not flow to activities that degrade the environment, uh, and nature and financing the green. So looking at directing uh, capital towards uh, direct investments in restoration. And this is where the, um, uh, the EIB has a role to play. So first in terms of greening the finance through uh, the setting up of standards. And uh, we have moved from a no net loss of biodiversity to a no loss of biodiversity. What that means in concrete terms is uh, is one uh, is a bit challenging to, to to translate. However, making sure that none of our finance that our financing ends up being nature what we use and and the new term that is being thrown about uh, in, in let's say the policy context and also in the context of the post twenty twenty global biodiversity framework um is nature positive um but then going from you know uh, reducing uh, or let's say uh, reducing impact remediation uh we really need to go fi to finance uh, directly contribution to ecosystem restoration and that is really initiating that uh 
native recovery, uh, um, recovering some of those ecosystems, and then um, going towards full recovery, as as is uh, stated in the biodiversity strategy uh, to 2030, and then hopefully to uh, to 2050. Um, but some of the key drivers of underinvestment that we are uh, that we are seeing, and it applies to to us also. Uh, stems from the concern that restoration is mostly an upfront cost uh, with uh, the long-term social and environmental benefits that are not easily monetized. Uh, and so a, a big role, so what that means for, for the EIB, I mean, the fact that uh, key areas have been identified by the member states that need to be restored or uh, certain ecosystems uh, uh, by, um, need to be uh, protected facilitates uh, that, um, that prioritization. So also for the private sector, they actually have a clear idea with the national action uh, plans to go and say, okay, this is where we need to put our focus, or this is where we need to realign our financing. And that gives a certain amount of certainty and uh, uh, comfort, uh, if you will, with uh, um, because the valuation, we hope that the valuation has been done by, uh, uh, by the member states in say, uh, identifying those ecosystems as not only priority, but high value ecosystems that are absolutely critical uh, for the sustenance of our economy and human well being. So, this also uh, gives uh, a little more um, uh, comfort not only to the private sector. Uh, but uh, also creates, uh, in a way, a taxonomy of restoration activities and standardized, and you can start having standardized frameworks and institutions for managing a portfolio of restoration projects. The, also, what the restoration law hopefully does is uh, that um, the uh, knowledge and the data on the costs and benefits of restorations are captured into that prioritization. And that allows then also private sector and financial institutions such as the EIB to take the appropriate action that it needs to do. Um, it also will be able then, because the data is there, the indicators are there, will be able to uh, monitor the trends in terms of the financing and its contribution to restoring uh, those activities. And then the structure um, and timing of the costs and benefits of restoration, uh, that is a, um, which make the risk return profiles of investments less competitive than other investments will be also um, determined by, this, uh, by the national action plans. Um, because they've been prioritized, they are the uh, ecosystems uh, uh, at, uh, at risk, and therefore, uh, again, um, the risk profile then, then, then changes. It allows then also, uh, because there would be commitment also from, uh, there's policy commitment from, from the governments that allows already uh, um, uh, the de-risking of, uh, of, uh, of the investments. Um, the biggest challenge generally then that we find, of course, uh, and, and this is uh, through experience in directly finding restoration activities, of course, for, for financial institutions, is the lack uh, of knowledge about bankable business models for restoration projects. And this is something that now, uh, given that this is a, a priority for, for the EU and in uh, as part of the, as Claire very clearly uh, mentioned it's part of the EU Green Deal. It is also a solution to, uh, um, uh, to the, the, the dual crisis, not only of addressing biodiversity loss, but also uh, uh, climate, um, is how do we use the existing toolbox that we have in order to be able to finance uh, those restoration projects? And something that we've been working on uh, is that um, looking at nature markets, putting those restoration activities because individual bankable projects are difficult to find. And so uh, is there a way um, to, and, uh, to look at harnessing uh, the, ca uh, the capabilities and resources of the private sector to efficiently deploy capital and encourage innovation needed uh, by creating these markets for nature and environmental services. 
Um, of course, that comes with a whole slew of uh, different uh, issues and, uh, and challenges because you need to create high integrity markets for these, uh, for these uh, uh, restoration activities or nature-based uh, environmental services. But this we see as a, p a potential to drive uh, nature recovery across, uh, across the uh, EU. So working with farmers and landholders, uh, working with regulators, uh, working with also the public sector, but uh, uh, NGOs uh, alike, we need to, uh, I think, look at these environmental markets uh, to unlock uh, private investments in, in, in restoration. I will stop right there and uh, hand over back to Jan. Thank you very much, Eva. Uh, so we now, without further ado, would like to turn it over to questions, which was the main idea. And we have, uh, if you will look at, um, I will share my screen for a moment, but what was sent out with the announcement was a uh, included possible questions. Let's see, I'm sorry, I'm not sure you're seeing the, um, the right screen here, but at the bottom of the announcement for this webinar were about five possible questions, which I'm going to read from. I'm not sure, are you, are you seeing the question? It's not apparent to me on my screen. And uh, the first question is to Claire, let me get this out of the way. There is already a lot of existing environmental legislation, the Water Framework Directive, Birds and Habitats Directive, which is not implemented. How can this nature restoration law make a difference? Shall I answer uh, yes, now, yes, Jan? Yes, please. Yes, okay. I, mm -hmm. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yes, uh, I think the first thing I would say in general is that um, I see this uh, piece of law as really complementary to what exists already because it touches restoration, you know. Uh, so it goes really beyond the traditional um, way of seeing, you know, environmental policy, which was to focus on on protection of nature. Here we really go beyond that. Um, then if we go a little bit more uh, specifically into um, the, the freshwater provisions, um, and, and this idea of river connectivity, I think is really uh, innovative and, and bringing something new because in the water framework directive, you had requirements for um, what was called river continuity, um, but this uh, was not very well defined and actually it could encompass some actions linked to, for instance, um, making some barriers like dams uh, passable for fish but it, it did not entail full connectivity, meaning a, a river uh, that would be completely free flowing. So in that sense, I think um, the, the river connectivity provisions in the nature restoration law are really additional to the water framework directive um, provisions. Um, and it's the same if you compare, um, you know, with the, the habitats directive, um, here in the nature restoration law, you have requirements to, you know, improve um, the habitats for species, but also to recreate new habitats. So there is also something additional there. Um, and on the question on implementation, finally, um, I think what is um, what goes beyond, for instance, the Water Framework Directive is that um, uh, for the first time, uh, the Commission will or could have the possibility to ask member states to submit a new national restoration plan if uh, it doesn't give the guarantees that it can achieve the target set by the law, uh, which is different than um, the Water Framework Directive, where member states need to submit uh, river basin management plans, but the Commission cannot really um, ask member states to resubmit something new uh, if it doesn't meet the standards. So uh, yeah, I think in, in that sense, it's really complementary to uh, what exists now and really additional in, in ambition. Well, thank you very much, Claire. Um, we have already two questions submitted in the chat and uh, I would like, I'd like to, 
ask you to look at the second question, but in light of something already, uh, as well as address something, what can the contribution of the scientific community be? And there is, uh, as part of this, you might consider addressing this, a suggestion from the UK, from Rayscape, Rayscape, I can't pronounce, suggesting that we all dedicate to the future machine learning oversight software that can see across wide ranges of data and remove bias and improve transparency of data, thus halting the development of what we in our company now recognize as data poverty. So that is one aspect of what the scientific community might, uh, might how it might respond. So if you in general could address that as well as the wider question, thank you. Hello, I'm sorry, that was to me the asker of the question, was it? Yes, please. Yeah, yeah, okay, so uh, hello everybody. My name's Christian Murray here. Hopefully I can give you a picture of my face here at home. Hello everybody, thank you. Great work, obviously, what a great team. I was just saying to my grandchildren, it takes a million of us around the world to make this stuff work. Um, our position here is we're discovering the, the value of data, of big agri-data and its impacts across the way that we interpret future plans is that there is so much data available right now, and yet it's not actually freely available to the people who need to ask questions of that data. And what we're getting is a separation of the accessibility for smaller groups and organizations to have useful access to data which means that the decisions are inherently then only made by the larger groups of organizations who have large resources to apply to the big data. So our approach is that we want to deploy and we are doing it within our own little efforts as an SME. So we represent that small medium enterprise of the giant ESG network. And we uh, engage specifically only in blended and stacked finance which means that we can add everybody's money together at once and the government ain't gonna hit us for taxes here or taxes there. Uh, we're bringing this out of Saskatchewan, Canada and England. Um, but the point is, is that we need to have a machine learning software. And what it's gonna do is it's gonna do what we call frugal dynamic modeling, which is gonna look at only these real key points of obvious repeatable data, scrap, the 80% of the confusing data allow us to then engage in simpler data transfers that give us, it, it's a bit absurd, but it's like less data, but it's more accurate in the long run. So that's uh, where my whole uh, point came from. Thank you for your time. Thank you. So Claire, uh, uh, that issue perhaps, and the wider question of what can be the contribution of the scientific community. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I'm not um, really sure that the, the, there was a question really, I think it was more a comment, um, but but point taken on, on the data accessibility. I think um, on the question of the scientific community contribution, um, indeed what I, what I see is that there is a need, I think, to evaluate the restoration needs um, more accurately. Uh, for instance, if you look at, uh, you know, Article 7.3 on the uh, restoration uh, of the floodplains, there is no target um, that is associated to, to that. And I think one of the reasons is that um, there is a lack of data on, you know, what's the state of the floodplains in Europe and what uh, is the area that would need to be restored to uh, well, sustain ecosystems, but also uh, improve the resilience to climate change impact. So I think there, um, indeed, there would be a need for, I mean, for the scientific community to help um, bridge this, this gap. Um, and also, I think more um, generally, and it was said a little bit by Eva, I think any um, uh, support from the scientific community to help assessing the benefits of restoration uh, would be very helpful to put uh, also, as she said, a value on, uh, you know, the, uh, the restored ecosystems. I think that would really help uh, to, to support investments in, in restoration and also to uh, convince uh, 
um, decision makers to uh, to do more large scale restoration. Thank you. Uh, we have now received about five or six questions from the audience, and so rather than go with the general questions, I'm going to go straight to the um, uh, to the questions coming from the audience. Uh, Kirsty Blackstock has asked uh, two questions and. The first is for Claire, uh, maybe I don't understand well, but when we talk about restoring past habitats, for instance, wetlands, what is the what are the baseline reference conditions? And is this only for N2K designations or all past wetlands, many drained for different land uses? Oh, you're muted, Claire. I'm sorry, I was muted indeed. Um, yes, so uh, indeed what uh, the proposal of the Commission says is that uh, it would target indeed the wetlands um, that, uh, I mean, the, the habitat type that are listed in Annex um, 1 of the Habitats Directive, but wetlands are part of this, this Annex 1. Um, it, it focused on the ones that are not currently in good conditions, so the baseline would be uh, what is, you know, in the reporting that member states have to do under the Habitats um, Directive. And it says that um, uh, the, the wetlands should be um, improved to uh, reach good conditions. So indeed, um, I think the baseline for that is uh, the definitions that are um, that are uh, included in the um, in the in the habitats directive, and that's that's the baseline for for this article. Thank you. Uh, there's a question now for Eva from Kirsty Blackstock. If the she's asking, is there an existing nature market in action that we can look at? I know of water allocation mechanisms in Australia and carbon trading, but not sure if these are nature markets. Eva, you're muted. Sorry, I mean, one would think that by now we would be used to this. Um, so there is no such thing as, uh, or that we can qualify as a nature market. You're absolutely right, Kirsty. I mean, you've got water markets already. You've got them in Australia. You've got them in the US. Um, uh, and you've got them in some of the developing countries, notably uh, Costa Rica, uh, and I think I do believe Colombia has a, a, a water market. Um, and um, and then you you've got the carbon market. What you do have is a nascent by what they call a biodiversity credit market. The Australians are are, are looking at that, and the Australians have developed um, biodiversity credits. Uh, but not for offsets. So it's it's actually this uh, this net gain. Um, and uh, but it's again very nascent. At the forefront, actually, of developing these nature markets uh, is the UK. Uh, we have to say that it's part of the UK uh, recover, uh, nature recovery plan. Uh, and but there are three pillars, uh, as I mentioned, that need to be um to be addressed and one is the market design uh, uh and there you need all the right stakeholders around uh the table to to really uh design that market with a clear policy framework coupled with the right incentives uh and institutional architecture uh so that it builds not only business confidence in investing in nature but it meets regulatory commitments right so those regulatory commitments would be the requirements under the nature uh, under the restoration law then you need the market governance uh so you need the clear standards and accreditation process uh, that uh, will provide the assurances uh, that uh, those restoration activities are really delivering on restoration outcomes um, while providing, of course, uh, uh, a certain tr uh, trusted uh, currency uh, for trade in the environmental services. And then the market operation. So you need that market infrastructure, the rules, the contracts uh, that will facilitate fair and efficient trade. Uh, so to ensure uh, public and private in, uh, investment in high quality nature recovery projects. So 
uh, in the right locations. Uh, and that's defined again by the national uh, action plans for the communities and then of course for, uh, for, for, for the environment. Once you have all these elements in place, then you do have, then you can, you know, start uh, with, a, with a nature market. But we are far from that. Uh, the discussions were had at uh, actually at COP27, uh, and uh, these discussions will be co uh, continuing also under the post-2020 GDF um, at in Montreal. Thank you very much. There is a question for you, Eva, from Ellis Penning. You say that there is an existing toolbox that the EIB already can use for financing restoration projects. Do you think the restoration law will influence this set of tools or will you be developing new tools? And if so, could you give examples? Okay, um, so the, the existing toolbox that we have, I mean, it's, it's talking about the financial products that we offer traditionally, right? Um, the disadvantage that the that the EIB has, it doesn't have uh, immediate access to grant financing. So everything we do is a loan uh, in one form or another. It's either equity through funds uh, or uh, an investment loan. That means that um, the loan needs to be paid back. Uh, and that's when I talked about bankable projects, you need to have a sustained uh, uh, revenue flow, at least in order to be able to pay back the, the loan. The problem with, uh, with uh, some of these, um, uh, let's say these investment loans and these products is uh, biodiversity is very local. Uh, and making sure that the financial flows go really to the communities that are custodians of that nature is, uh, is always been a challenge. So in the EU, of course, it's less of an issue, um, but it's certainly in a developing country context for us, uh, making sure that, for example, traditional communities, indigenous communities that are really custodians of that nature that manage uh, uh, biodiversity have access to those funds in order to continue and to restore, uh, to, uh, to uh, carry out those activities to restore nature. Um, Nevertheless, uh, I think uh, uh, the, the, the issue that we have is we might finance a project, let's say in one member state, and then a year later, another project in another member state. So you're not getting that impact that you're supposed to be getting. And uh, when we talked about new tools, uh, we need to uh, start talking about an ecosystem-based approach or landscape-based approach. How can we use the existing financial products that we have to actually finance a whole entire landscape uh, without just having you know, a fragmented approach in, in the different landscapes and just financing a, 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 a restoration uh, project, uh, let's say in Spain, and then um, another restoration project, a small restoration project in uh, in Germany. So let's bring that together. So we have the maximum impact. Looking at the prioritization of those uh, uh, of those ecosystems that need to be restored, maintained, and making those decisions, it might mean that you know um, uh, we need to focus uh, rather than spread ourselves too thin. Thank you. Uh, Lawrence Carvalho uh, has a question for you, Eva. You say there's an exist, oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> you just did. Uh, uh, Simone Daniela Langhans is asking you, is there a conversation around how the efforts to develop RBMPs and restoration plans could be combined? Maybe for both, for Claire and more on the financial perspective yeah. from Eva, yeah. Okay, thank you, um, thank you Simone. Not that I'm aware of. So the way we've been approaching uh, the river basin management plans or uh, from, as a financial institution um, is looking at uh, an integrated, uh, uh, let's say, integrated water resource uh, approach. So looking upstream, downstream, right? Um, and making sure that uh, where we invest, we take it uh, from, from that integrated approach. Um, we had at, um, I, I was invited by, by the commission to speak uh, at COP27 on the, on the water energy sec, uh, nexus. And this is exactly key, right? So it, you need to look at it 
from uh, from that overall approach and uh, traditionally when we've been looking at hydropower i mean uh, claire mentioned uh, 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 the removal of dams we tend to only look downstream instead of also looking upstream right and when you do a cumulative impact assessment you look uh, at downstream you don't always look at upstream you look at some of the stakeholders and you rely on on the uh, on the rbmps right uh, and you rely on the competent authority. There are exemptions, and these exemptions tend to be used. Uh, be sometimes these exemptions become the, more the norm than rather the ex exemptions. And I think uh, the the uh, the work that then, as a financing institutions, we need to take uh, into account by also looking at the financial risks of not taking a um, an integrated approach um is is really to um to to look at it um and have that conversation between the the the, the rbmps and uh and the um and the restoration bring them together uh without you know looking at the let's say putting the exemption aside and saying okay yes there may be an exemption but what does it actually mean are we going to end up with a stranded asset here um i don't think to date the conversation has been had by policymakers to be honest and when i look at um uh we've been on the platform on the uh, on the taxonomy platform developing the the criteria for substantial contribution uh and when we've looked at it we've seen that the rbmps never came up in the restoration activities right uh, so that was not a criteria uh, to have, you know, the RBMPs in place or to have that nexus. So maybe that is an issue that really needs to be escalated and elevated. Absolutely agree. Because it's it seems to be like a bit of a double effort. Like I'm a, from a freshwater perspective, anyways, or an effort that could be joined and, you know, Absolutely. like facilitate Absolutely. each other and and save resources massively. I think. Uh, I think the synergies ha are not uh, haven't been clearly made, uh, and I think not everyone has been around the table. Um, I, I do believe colleagues like yourselves have been in the discussions, but it hasn't been made very clear. And I think, uh, and the result of that is the vague language that you have around freshwater uh, restoration in the uh, in the current law. If I may add to to that, um, so indeed in the uh, in the current proposal on the EU nature restoration law, there is a requirement that uh, national restoration plans take into account existing planning documents. So indeed, it's a bit vague, but in theory, it includes the river basin management plans. But also something quite important, the Commission has been saying several times publicly to member states that um, actually the river restoration efforts that are already planned in river basin management plans, so in the current one that go uh, from the period 2022 to 2027, um, the measures that are outlined then there would count automatically towards um, the restoration targets. Uh, so that's quite important because often member states, uh, we hear from them, oh, but you know, the targets for 2030, they are very difficult to achieve because we'll have only a couple of years from the adoption of the nature restoration law to 2030. But actually, they will be able to count uh, towards their target the efforts already made under the, the river basin management plan. So that's uh, an important thing, I think, to keep in mind for uh, decision makers. Thank you, Claire. Thank you, Eva. Uh, we have a little time left, and we still have two questions now, the general questions that were posed in the flyer that accompanied this. To Eva and Claire, earlier this year, the Inve European Investment Bank supported the annual Dam Removal Europe Award 2022. Why did the bank decide to support dam removal? What will the bank do in the future to continue supporting dam removal? Oh, 
think it's a political decision. <laughs> no, um, partly. I mean, there are a, a number of dams in the uh, in the EU that um, are coming uh, uh, end of life, right, uh, and are being decommissioned. And this is something that uh, we would support also uh, financially. You know, if a utility just or an operator of that dam just come to us, and in terms of decommissioning and restoring uh, uh, the the flow of of the river, it's uh, something that we can finance, uh, and, and therefore we see you know uh, going through um, uh, going through. I mean, uh, looking at, at at the different uh, types of dams that are uh, that are in place, um, and seeing okay, which are the ones that we can, uh, of course, uh, uh, remove at, at this point in time. I, I think we do acknowledge the importance of um, restoring. Uh, the 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 free flow of, of uh, Europe's rivers, and I, I think there's no no uh, discussion on, on that. There are challenges associated with it, no, no, notably the fact that there are a number of countries that are heavily reliant on hydropower, um, and uh, so it's it's not meaning that we stop operation and decommission every single dam that is there. But I think we think if it's done well. Uh, I think we can make a tremendous amount of uh, out of pro uh, of progress. However, the policy context and the support uh, from the from the regulators uh, and our policy masters needs to be there um, because this is not something uh, that that can be done without the commitment also from from uh, member states. Thank you. Now I'm not sure if you answered the last question in your. Uh, pardon my ignorance, but there is a follow-up. Could you explain the business model for removing dams with EIB loans? Um, the business model for removing, uh, yeah, well, uh, I think that there, there are two uh, there, there are two aspects. It, it would be a loan. So the problem with a, a public sector loan is that river basin uh, authorities are, cannot take a loan, right? Um, because it's within their national budgets uh, and uh, and therefore they can't uh, um, uh, take a loan. So it would be private sector. That means utilities uh, and uh, and uh, private sector operators of uh, of dams uh, can take a loan to be able to to decommission uh, and, and and remove those dams. And then we would be able to also fund the restoration activities associated with uh, uh, with the um, uh, uh, with that dam uh, removal so um, I mean there, there, there are different uh, models that probably could be looked at uh, certainly like we've done uh, in forestry uh, in terms of uh, renaturalizing rivers uh, we have a small project uh, in the um, in Luxembourg on renaturalizing the the uh, river AZ but we have the Emsha renaturalizing uh, the Emsha River, where we've looked at it through the financing also of the wastewater treatment plant. So I think there are models that can be replicated for uh, for also the the removal of dams uh, going through the utilities and operators themselves. Thank you. Uh, I'm not sure how strict we are here. We do go over time occasionally. We have one question outstanding at the moment from Lawrence Carvalho. For Claire, what do you advise us is the best strategy to recommend revisions of the draft NRL text to make fresh waters more explicit? Who should we approach? When yes. do we need to do this? <clears throat> Thanks, I was uh, typing in the chat. Uh, the best moment is clearly now. Uh, for, I mean, for suggesting amendments to the European Parliament, uh, the deadline for new amendments is, I think, 19th of January. So it's really now that you have to, um, to do it and to approach um, members of the European Parliament. Uh, for the member states, you have a little bit more time and then you have to go through um, national governments directly or the permanent representations of those national governments um, in, in Brussels. But yeah, I would say the earlier, the better. Okay. Uh, if Thanks. We, are there any questions anyone wants to ask a live question uh, before we close up? Because I believe, if I'm not uh, wrong, that around after one hour, we generally are bringing this to a close. Okay. Um, 
I would just like to raise one point, take the liberty as moderator to ask a very broad question, which maybe Eva, you could get back to me on. Uh, a prominent environmental writer, Bill McKibben, very well known in the US, I don't know how well known in Europe, uh, wrote an article about the abysmal record of nations doing what they promised to do at the COP in terms of the investments and the investment funds. And what he said is one model for getting around this is that where is the money if the nations aren't putting money in for environmental projects? Who and where would you go? And it's in large pension funds. There are many trillions of euros of pension funds. The key issue is lowering the risk of inv investing in the environment. And of course, for the global south, the risk is extremely high. So that's where he said, that's the point where the World Bank, the Asian Development Bank, the African Development Bank could make key interventions of investments that would lower that risk to the point where it'd be attractive for private investors who are managing investment funds. Now, I know we're talking about EU law here and EU, how EU funds are spent, but to me, this is a kind of a global issue that might pertain. And I know it's a huge question, so maybe we ha uh, have to get uh, to this at another or privately, uh, but I would love to hear from you about this because it's extremely important. In, in two minutes, I can tell you, so the MDB signed a joint statement on, uh, and that includes the EIB, World Bank, African, Asian, and uh, EBRD, and well, uh, yes, and Inter-American. Um, uh, a joint statement on uh, nature, people, and planet, where we have uh, exactly that, you know, is how do we realign our financing uh, to the post-2020 uh, GBF um, uh, and make sure that exactly de-risk uh, those, uh, those, those investments. The problem is national governments uh, have to also mobilize their own resources. It can't come all from uh, multilateral development banks. The ask actually going into COP15 is uh, indeed that. Why is it that uh, the MDBs are not uh, committing to a financial target? Uh, and the reason is, I mean, uh, and if you look and the ask of 100 billion again, this year, 100 billion minimum to the global south of uh, uh, ODA, to even 700 billion, a hard ask, right? Um, and uh, and this is what we've been struggling with. Uh, actually, parallelly to this meeting, there was a meeting uh, with the UK government, uh, the German ministry, and the MD heads of MDBs, exactly on you know what can we do to increase our financing? Can we make that commitment? Um, but yes, absolutely, you can. But the question is, you know, you need those bankable projects. Uh, you need those bankable, and maybe uh, one uh, one area that we've just seen uh, that uh, Inter American Bank, uh, Inter American Development Bank, has launched uh, two debt for nature swaps with uh, the Nature Conservancy. Um, and I can't remember the second one, uh, but uh, have, a, have a look at those two debt for nature swaps. That would be one, uh, one aspect in terms of de-risking that financing uh, by coming at it as, and debt, uh, doing debt relief and as well as then uh, aligning that debt relief then to, to support uh, uh, nature uh, restoration. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank both our speakers for extremely concise, rapid answers to pretty complicated questions and very, not, and very clear presentations. Uh, a very good uh, discussion in the audience. I have written down all the questions which I'm willing to share. Uh, if anyone would like kind of a, a little bit of a record, we also have a recording of this if one wants to review it and that's also accessible on the URL provided in the chat. Uh, I think I'll turn it over back to you, Jörg. Uh, uh, thanks everyone for a great uh, webinar. Yeah, thanks also from the Merlin team. Uh, thanks for the presentations and for the nice discussions. And um, as Jan already said, the uh, recording will be available on the Merlin project website um, within the next days, I would say. So thanks everybody, have a nice afternoon. And see you hopefully uh, on the next webinar, which will be, I don't know exactly, uh, early February. I guess January will be in winter, in, in the winter break.
So the next one will be, I guess, uh, the first Monday in February. Thanks a lot. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you.